All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Welcome back to our Sunday night Bible study. Thank you so much for taking the time every Sunday evening to, to participate in our online Bible studies. I, I pray that you find these lessons a help, uh, and that's really my goal uh, on Sunday nights is, yes, to present a, a factual lesson, uh, is, is for us to, to dig deep into to God's Word, but I, I want these lessons to serve as a, as a positive challenge for us as, as a reminder uh, and as an encouragement of, of, of what we need to be as disciples. And I pray, I pray that that's how they, they come across and that they are helpful to you. We have been looking at the kingdom. We, we've looked at kingdom living specifically. We, we've looked at the establishment of, of the kingdom. We, we looked at Jesus, the kingdom being Jesus' body, it being His church. We, we talked about how to, to become a part of, of that kingdom and, and how God works in repentance, how God works in, in confession, and how God works through baptism to redeem our minds, our thoughts, our emotions, our actions. I want us to conclude by looking at a subject that we need to be reminded of from time to time, and that is worship. We cannot talk about kingdom living without talking about worship because this is an incredibly important subject in regards to kingdom living. And what you and I need to understand is that worship is a tremendous privilege. Worship is a great privilege. And many times when you hear worship talked about, there's one verse that is brought up every time. It's John 4, 24. God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And I don't know how many times you've heard someone say, you've got, that means you've got to worship out of sincerity. You've got to worship from the heart. You've got to worship from the commands of God. But that's a misapplication of John 4, 24. Because the fact is God has always required worship in spirit and in truth. Ask Nadab and Abihu about that. You see, Jesus is showing a contrast between Old Testament worship and New Testament worship in John chapter 4. The worship in spirit means that instead of all the, the physical traits of Old Testament worship, you had physical sacrifices, you had a physical building, you had all of those things. Instead, New Testament worship was going to be more in line with the nature of God. And notice what John 4.24 said about God. He is a spirit. So worship to Him, if it's going to be in more in line with His nature, has to be spiritual worship. And that's what we do. We are all priests now. We are all spiritual priests. Our, our, our sacrifices, they're not physical sacrifices, they're spiritual sacrifices of praise and of service. And then we see this worship in truth. You see, Old Testament worship, most of the acts of worship were a shadow of things to come. They, they symbolized things to come. The tabernacle symbolized the kingdom of Christ. Well, Christ is that tabernacle now. And so we see a contrast between the old law and the new law. Jesus and John 4, we need to understand what John 4, 24 is really telling us, but here's... Here's where I want to go. How can I worship with God? How can I worship God properly if I don't truly understand what worship is? You see, there's so much confusion. There's so much debate. There, there's so much division over the subject of worship. And instead of worship being something that brings Christians together as one body, which it should, many times, as I just said, it becomes the very thing that divides us. I don't like this song. I don't like the way that the song leader leads these songs. I don't like the way that the prayers are done. I, I don't like the way that you know we, we have it organized. I much prefer it this way. I want to do it this way. And it becomes something that has caused division. 
and divisiveness. Sometimes I wonder how many of us truly understand what it means to worship. And so in this lesson, I want us to focus on just a couple of things to help us understand worship. And here's where I want us to begin. Worship, worship is an act. Worship is an act. The Greek word most often translated worship is the word prosca, uh, proskuneo. Proskuneo. It occurs about 60 times in Scripture. And it literally means to, to prostrate yourself in reverence before someone. It means to kiss. If Similarly, it's similar to a dog licking his master's hand. And you can say, well, that, that's, that's terrible. That, that's, that's not my, my image of worship. But it means to, to bow down before, to kiss. It always denotes a specific act of reverent praise or adoration. And I think one of the best places... And one of the most beautiful descriptions of proskuneo, if I truly want to understand what this word means, I need to, to look at the 24 elders that are mentioned in Revelation chapter 4. Open your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 4, and I want us to start in verse 9. Revelation 4, beginning in verse 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who is seated on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are You, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For You created all things and by Your will, they existed and were created. Now, I want us to stop and remind ourselves of something. What is the book of Revelation all about? The book of Revelation was written to first century Christians who were under immense and terrible persecution by the Roman Emperor Domitian. They were being, they were being treated terribly. They were being treated terribly. And so the whole book of Revelation is reminding these first century Christians to be faithful. Because Roman, Roman culture said that the Roman emperor was deity. The Roman emperor was a god. The Roman emperor was eternal. And what you find being told to these first century Christians is it's not a man that's sitting on the throne. Yes, everything in the book of Revelation is written in figurative language, apocalyptic language. And so it can be confusing. It can be intimidating. But when I understand that it was written to those first century Christians, when I understand the context, it becomes so much easier to understand. Yes, there are messages for us that we need to learn that God is still on His throne. No matter who's elected president in our country, no matter what is going on, God is on the throne. And what we find here is that it's not a Roman emperor that was sitting on the throne, but it was God. And notice the first words out of the mouth of these 24 elders in this scene of worship. They bow before God on the throne and they say, worthy, worthy. That word worthy is where we get our English word worship. So worship is the act of reverently bowing before the throne of God, declaring worthy are you our Lord. That's what we have taking place. You have, that, that's this idea of proskuneo. Bowing down before God, worthy are you, our Lord. There's another worship scene in the book of Revelation. If we just turn one chapter over to Revelation chapter 5, start reading with me in verse 8. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. They're worshiping the lamb. Each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the 
prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God and they shall reign on the earth. So not only do you have the 24 elders worshiping the Father on the throne, but you have the 24 elders worshiping the Lamb because He is worthy. He is worthy. Jesus is every bit as worthy of our worship. But what we find here is John figuratively describing what goes on heaven, what goes on in heaven when the saints are praying and singing on earth. The bowl of incense represents our prayers. The harps represent our songs of, of, of praise. So when I, when I sing prayer, when I sing, when, when I offer prayers that reverently declare that Jesus is worthy, the Father is worthy, these are acts that can be accurately described as worship. So when we assemble and we sing, and we pray, we're worshiping. When I bow my head during the day, I'm worshiping to pray. I'm worshiping. If I'm singing songs during the day that declare that He is worthy, I'm worshiping. And here's the, here's the beautiful thing. Worship isn't something that only takes place in one location. If we go back to John 4, we see the context is Jesus talking with the Samaritan woman at the well. They talk about worship. And notice they have a discussion. You say you've got to go to Jerusalem to worship the woman to Jesus. We go to the mountain to worship. And Jesus says this in verse 21. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. The point being, there's going to come a time where it's not about a specific location. You're going to worship the Father wherever you are. And I'm so thankful for that. This current pandemic has been really difficult, but here's the beauty of it. It has reminded us that we can worship God from anywhere. We can worship God from anywhere. That doesn't negate the importance of assembling, but it shows us that we can truly worship our Father from anywhere. We can worship the Lamb from anywhere by reverently declaring that He is worthy. Here's the second point that we need to make when it comes to worship in the kingdom, and it's this. Worship is not about you, and worship is not about me. I said in the introduction that worship becomes the very thing instead of bringing us together that divides us. Because we all have our opinions, we all have our thoughts when it comes to worship. This is what I like. I'm about to finish my 16th year of full-time uh, ministry. And I don't say that to brag. I, I simply show that I have about 16 years of experience. And one of the, the most common complaints that I hear, no matter where I've been, is worship. Whether it's the song leader picking better songs or different songs, you know, that's, that song is older. We, we sing it too much. We need to sing another song. Whether it comes to how worship is organized, I, I had one uh, sister tell me one time because the contribution was done at a separate time than the Lord's Supper that, that she didn't like that. She would never step foot in the building again. There are so many things about worship that divide us because we forget that worship is not about me. It's not. True worship has absolutely nothing to do with my preferences. Absolutely nothing. Because when we look at worship, we see that worship is something that is to be done according to faith. God has always desired worship according to faith. And here's what I mean by that. Look at the example of Cain and Abel in Hebrews 11 and verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. We often talk about the difference between Cain and Abel. 
Well, Cain did something wrong. Abel didn't. And if we're going to be more specific, here's the issue. Abel's sacrifice was accepted because Abel offered his sacrifice according to faith. By faith, Abel offered a more acceptable sacrifice. Cain did not offer his sacrifice. Cain did not offer his worship according to faith. Where does faith come from? Hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We know Romans 10 and verse 17. But all we know is, that, is this. Abel offered his sacrifice according to, to something that they were told by God. Cain did not. In fact, when worship starts becoming about me, when it starts becoming about my preferences, it stops being worship. And we often point to other groups when it comes to this, but that is such a dangerous thing to do. This lesson isn't directed towards anyone but me. I've got to look at myself. How do I approach worship? Is worship about me? Is it about my preferences? Is it about what I like? Because if the answer, if I can honestly answer that question as... If I'm, if I'm being honest with myself, let me word it this way. If I'm being honest with myself and I understand that and come to the realization that worship is, is really about me, yes, you know, I, I'm just, I'm going through the motions or, or maybe it's, you know, I'm not, I don't put forth the effort if it's not a song that I sing that I like. I, I'm not putting forth the effort because, you know, maybe I have a problem with, with the prayers or the lesson, then it stops being worship. If I'm more concerned about my preferences than I am God, it stops being worship. Worship is simple. Worship is declaring with our lips that the Lord is worthy. Look at Hebrews 13 and 15. Hebrews 13 and verse 15, Through Him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of the lips that acknowledge His name. That is it. That's worship. It's declaring with our lips that the Lord is worthy through our songs, through our prayer. That's worship. And in John 4, Jesus spoke of a worship that is pleasing to God. And so when we look at John 4, 24, that's the question that I need to ask. Is my worship pleasing to God? Is my worship pleasing to God? I can know if my worship is pleasing to God by making sure that I worship according to His Word, to make sure that I worship properly, that I'm not making it about me, I'm not making it about my, my preferences, but I am bowing before Him and declaring that He is worthy. I say at the beginning of just about every sermon that I pray that you find our services an encouragement, but I say this, our number one focus is to bring glory to God. Our number one focus is to, to please God. I can know if my worship is pleasing to Him or not, if I'm honest with myself, if I truly examine myself according to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 to see if, it's, if I'm making it about me, if I'm approaching worship in an arrogant way, in a prideful way, if worship is something that I use to elevate myself over someone else, or if I approach worship from this way, I want to bow before God and I want to declare that He is worthy. I want Him to know that my focus, that my sole desire is to please Him, is to glorify Him. Remember what Jesus said about worship. Anytime I approach worship, I need to be asking this question, is my worship pleasing to God? Is it pleasing to God? Or am I causing worship, or am I making worship something that it was never intended to be? If my sole focus is to glorify God, is to bow before Him and declare that He is worthy, if I remove self from worship, my worship takes on a whole different form. It has a whole different meaning. I, I used this illustration in, in a lesson recently, and I want to 
use it again. I believe it was last week uh, that I used this illustration when we were talking about the resurrection, about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I said it's easy for things to, you hear them, you talk about them enough for them to become habit. And I made reference to a song that when I survey the wondrous cross, and, and there are a few other songs that we sing often over the years. And it's easy just to forget the meaning behind the words and just to, to go through the motion. How, how do I overcome that? No matter how many times I partake of the Lord's Supper, it can still have meaning if I approach it from the right mindset. That I, I approach the Lord's Supper I approach the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus with the mindset that He is worthy. That I want to declare that He is worthy. When it comes to singing, I can sing the same songs without them losing meaning by focusing on the lyrics and remembering that I'm doing this because I want to declare that He is worthy. Yes, we, we need to fight the urge just to do things the same old way because we've always done them that way. We need to fight the urge of, of going through the motions. And I do that by remembering what He has done for me. God is the only one worthy of worship because of what He has done for us. And if the cross is always in the forefront of my mind, then my approach to worship it's easier to get my mind right when it comes to worship. You know, He has gone to such great lengths to save us. He has done, He continues to do so much for us. That needs to be ever present when I approach Him. I hope that this lesson has been helpful. Uh, I hope that it has been an encouragement to you. I pray, I pray that we approach worship properly. That we keep what's most important always in the forefront of our minds. With that being said, let's end in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for loving us. Lord, help us to approach You in worship properly. Help us to understand that we need to bow before You and declare that You are worthy because of everything that You've done, everything that You did, and that You continue to do. Lord, I pray that You will help us to have the right mindset when we approach Your throne. Help us to imitate what we see taking place in Revelation chapter 4. And Lord, You alone are worthy. We ask all of this in Your Son's name. Amen. I look forward to being with you next time.